So today we're starting physics. All right, and the biggest theme in physics is energy. All right, because energy is part of everything. Without energy, nothing happens. All right. Um, now, there's different kinds of energy, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. All right, the kinds of energy that can be involved in, produced by, or used in mechanical systems. All right. If something is mechanical, what does it have? Okay, a mechanism. Cogs, gears, motor. Basically, it has moving parts. All right. Anything that is a mechanical system has to have moving parts. All right. Um, and as a result, okay, uh, there's forces involved. There's wear, friction. There's you know things like that um, that energy uh, can be produced by or be used up in. All right. So things like that to consider. Even a system like the one in this picture here, which is kind of hard to see, but this is the Inuit blanket toss. Right. Uh, once in a while, I've seen at the Alberta Summer Games, especially if it's hosted in the north, uh, they'll actually do a demonstration of this. All right. What the uh, what the Inuit used to use the blanket toss for was to be able to see greater distances in the tundra. If you've ever been like way up north, like beyond um, like Fort McMurray and that kind of stuff, where you get out of the boreal forest and into the tundra, it's nothing but it looks like prairie. Right. It looks like you're in Saskatchewan, southern Saskatchewan. Right. Where you can just see and there's you know the, the horizon is there and there's no hills there's no trees nothing all right well that's all well and good that you can see that far but so can your prey animals like you know deer or caribou or whatever so what they would do is in order to be able to see further since they can't climb a tree they would take out a blanket put everybody around it put one person in the middle and throw them up in the air with it Okay, and the higher they could throw them, the further that person could see, and it would enable them to see past the horizon and kind of cheat. All right, so their prey, they can't see that far. They're probably not going to see a person flying up in the air. Right? Even if they do, they won't understand what it means. All right, and then they'll be able to sneak up and ambush their prey and, and hunt them down. All right, now, in order to do that, though, involves different types of energy. Right? In order to throw somebody up in the air, what do you have to do? I'm thinking of a four-letter word that's not a swear. Okay, not the word I was thinking of. Starts with W. Work. Okay, you have to do work in order to throw somebody up into the air. All right, work in its strictest definition is a change or a transfer of energy. All right, so if you're going to do work on something, you're going to transfer energy from yourself to it. All right, and the way you do that is you exert a force on it, either a push or a pull. Okay, and that push or pull has to result in movement. So if you're one of the people on the blanket, you are pulling hard upwards on the blanket, exerting a force through a distance, and that results in the person flying up in the air. All right? So all of these people are doing work on that person and giving them the energy to fly up into the air. All right? When that person comes back down, do they have to do work again? Well, yes, yeah, sort of. They have to do work on the blanket because they have to absorb the energy of that person or they're going to get hurt. All right, and so they absorb the energy. They again exert a force on the blanket through a distance as the person lands on it. Okay, all right. So the different forms of energy here. Now the thing with energy is this: energy is invisible. Okay, energy is difficult to um, measure. Okay, it, you, you know, it's 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 just something that's kind of an out there idea. We use it all the time, but it's not matter. It's not material. Okay, I can't you know put it in my hand and go look. I've got energy here, because it's simply not matter, right? And so that, as a result, made it very difficult to explain and quantify and measure in early science. Right? They had no way to, to do that. They couldn't say, oh well, here's energy, all right? And uh, and it didn't seem to obey a lot of the laws that material things do. Right, um, and so that made it very, very difficult for people um, to get this idea of how it worked. Luckily, technology doesn't always require you to have an understanding of something in order to use it. Okay? We developed machines and technology that used energy well before we really knew what energy was. Right, it was just this convenient or, in some cases, hazardous byproduct of something that we were doing. Right, most of our machines do what for us? They do work. Okay. To do work, you require energy. 
All right, and that was the that was sort of the big problem: is where am I going to get energy from? And people thought for the longest time that you could get it for free. Right? Is it possible for something to do any work without putting anything into it? Nope, it isn't. All right, that's the myth of the perpetual motion machine. Right? That you can have a machine that does work even though you never do anything to it. All right? Such a thing is impossible. All right, different kinds of energy here. Okay. First kind of energy is chemical energy. Okay. Chemical energy we go over first because chemical energy dominates our society, our civilization. Right? Our civilization typically runs on chemical energy. What are some types of chemical energy that we use? Okay, cars use what? Gasoline, right? Gasoline, oil, coal, right? All of those things are chemical energy. Anything that is a fuel is chemical energy. Even a hydrogen fuel cell car is arguably chemical energy. All right? It involves the breaking of molecules to release the energy that is stored within them. All right? Chemical energy is a type of potential energy. You guys have heard the term potential energy before? Okay, there's potential energy and there's kinetic energy. All right? Kinetic energy is what you get after you burn the fuel. Right? When you burn the fuel, the molecules around are moving faster because they've gained energy as a result of you releasing it from the bonds it was stored in in these, in these fuel molecules. So when we burn gasoline, what we're effectively doing is taking the carbon chain it's made out of. So I'll give you an idea here. Two, three, four, Okay, this is octane. Every every spot here where I have a dash has an H on it. Okay, these dashes are the bonds between the carbon molecules. This is octane. It is the active ingredient in gasoline. Every one of these bonds, if broken, releases energy. Is there a lot of energy stored in this molecule? Yes, it is, which is why it's a convenient source of fuel. It's lightweight. It's fluid. Okay. Um, and as long as it's not exposed to a uh, spark, it's fairly non-volatile. Right? Um, so it's convenient to use as a fuel in cars. Right? Um, because it's fluid, it's also easy to transport from a location within the car to the en place where it's being burned, the engine. All right? we, there's other fuels that have way more energy in them than, than octane does, but they're not as convenient to use. Paraffin, candle wax, for example, Way bigger molecule. It's got 22 carbons in it as opposed to eight. What's the problem with using paraffin as a fuel for a car? Yeah, it's the refining process that puts in that determines how much octane is in there. Yeah. Okay. So, why would we not use paraffin as a fuel for cars if it has more energy in it? Uh, not so much it would burn up quicker. Can you put a solid into a fuel tank? <laughs> okay. Imagine trying to burn paraffin when it's minus 30. Okay. You try and get it from your end from your tank, which is in the back of your car, to the engine in the front of your car. There's no way to do that. Okay. You, you, you're, there's a pump in your car that is in the gas tank that pumps fuel in its liquid form to the engine. And you can't do that with candle wax. All right. It simply wouldn't work. So while it would be great, it's not convenient. All right. There were lots of fuels used in internal combustion engines before octane came along. In fact, the first ones ran on kerosene. All right. Kerosene is a very high energy molecule, too high energy. It was actually damaging the engines. Is what we use now in jet fuel. All right. Jet fuel is mostly kerosene, okay. the stuff you would use in like a old style camp stove. Okay, so chemical energy then is the energy that's within the bonds of certain chemicals, all right? And obviously we've been using that for a long time. As soon as we discovered fire, okay, we were using chemical energy to do work, all right? Whether that work was cooking food or making steam to drive a piston or whatever, okay? All right, um, so the evidence that there's chemical energy is that when you burn things, you get heat, okay? And so chemical energy is the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of compounds. Okay? The food you eat is chemical energy. All right? That's why we can measure the calories or the kilojoules that are in certain food items and know how much energy we've taken in. 
right? Your body breaks it down, okay? turns into glucose, breaks it down, and then releases the energy. Okay. Now, the discovery of this, guys, the main discovery of saying chemical energy is a form of energy was uh, discovered by Antoine Lavoisier. He was looking at different possible fuels for certain types of engines, and he discovered that different fuels produce different amounts of energy. All right? And so he found that the potential within certain molecules was greater than others, all right? which was important in being able to determine what types of fuels were best to use for what applications. All right? um, if you want something that produces uh, to use in a lamp, you would want something that produces more light than than heat, right? I mean, that's the whole reason we've gone to fluorescent bulbs, right? Like compact fluorescents, the ones with the coil, as opposed to incandescent. Since we can get the same amount of light out of a fluorescent bulb with way less heat, it's way more efficient, all right? So looking at things like that. All right. Now, electricity, electrical energy, and, and magnetism. These are kind of tied together because one can cause the other. All right, and that was discovered okay, uh, fairly early on. Now, the first type of harnessed electrical energy all right, was the Volta pile. Okay, that's what this thing is here. Alessandro Volta okay, was an Italian scientist, discovered that you could convert chemical energy into electrical energy directly. All right. Now, this is the first battery. Okay, that's why oftentimes on batteries you will see pile alkaline battery written on it. Okay, because it is in fact just like this. It is a pile of these discs. Okay, it's a pile style battery. Right, these discs contain a certain metal, and that metal, when it uh, begins to break down, releases electrons, and those electrons flow through a wire. And as they flow through a wire, they can do work on some other mechanism. Okay, that's how electrical energy works. Everybody follow me there? Yes? Okay. All right. Now, the big thing here, guys, is that electricity can cause magnetic effects. Okay? And a guy named Orsted discovered that. Okay? He was uh, a professor in a university, and he was doing a demonstration, actually, for some students and um, found this out almost by accident. He was uh, running an electric current through a wire okay to do something or other I don't know what and he happened to have a compass there as well and the compass was just sitting on the table and as soon as he turned on the electricity through the wire the compass went from pointing north to pointing parallel to the wire now what does a compass respond to yeah it responds to magnetic fields most of the time it responds to the magnetic field of the earth all right but you can fool a compass in certain situations all right when electrons run through a wire they disrupt the magnetic field around the wire okay and as a result they create essentially like an electromagnetic effect and what that can do is it creates a magnetic field that can affect the compass and make the compass point in the direction the magnetic field is going all right that's what happens on the earth okay here's the earth we've got the north pole here okay and the south pole down here okay and we get these magnetic lines of force that go through and around the earth, right? And if you're standing anywhere on the earth and you have a compass in your hand, it will point in the direction that these force lines go. Okay? And those force lines go from north to north to south. Right? But for them in most places that magnetic field is quite weak. So if you put your compass up near a current carrying wire, it will almost immediately go to that one because in that area the magnetic field there is stronger. Okay. How many people have ever gone under like a set of power lines and had their cell phone quit? Okay. Or your cordless phone, if you stand too close to the microwave, right? a lot of cordless phones at home will just they'll quit. Your Wi-Fi will quit. Right? Uh, I notice this with my iPad all the time. If I'm in, you know, in the kitchen and I'm doing something, someone fires up the microwave, forget it. I got no signal until the microwave gets turned off. Because right? it generates a huge magnetic field that disrupts all the radio waves in the area. Right? And then I can't get a signal on the Wi-Fi because the field that generates the Wi-Fi isn't strong enough. All right? Try it at home. You'll see. Okay? It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't hurt it at all. All right. All right. So just so we, we know that then electricity can cause magnetic effects. So a guy named Faraday comes along. He figures it probably goes the other way. All right. There's got to be a way to make magne magnetism generate electricity. That could be pretty useful. 
because then we'd have a way to make electrical energy. So what he did is he made a coil of wire and attached it to a voltmeter that measures electrical flow. Okay? And then he put a magnet through the coil of wire. Okay? Just pushed it down in here. Effectively what that did is this. The magnetic field of the magnet pushed the electrons that were part of the copper wire down and away from the magnet. And as a result, they flowed into the voltmeter and back. He generated a current by using a magnetic field to push the electrons through the wire. Okay? So we know that magnetism can produce electrical effects and electricity can produce magnetic effects. They're kind of vice versa. Okay? So we know that they are both types of energy because they did work. Okay? The electrons flowing through this wire had enough energy to make the compass move. That's work. All right. The uh, magnetism here pushed the electrons through here and were able to generate a reading on the voltmeter. That's work. They made the voltmeter needle move. All right. Because they were able to do work, we know they were both forms of energy. Everybody follow on that? Okay. Hey, so that's Orsted and Faraday. They were two pretty important guys. All right. Now, another guy came along and said, this is great. Magnetism produces electricity, electricity produces magnetism, but heat is readily available everywhere. Anytime you burn something, you get heat. So why not be able to turn heat into electricity? All right. So um, this guy here named Seebeck made this device. All right. He made what's called the first thermocouple. A thermocouple is any device that directly turns heat into electricity. There's only one problem with this device. It's horribly inefficient. It works, but it's horribly inefficient. You need so much heat to even get a respectable amount of electricity that it's just not worth doing. All right? um, but he proved that it can happen. So what he did is he took a compass needle. All right? He took two different pieces of metal. He took a rod of iron and this uh, horseshoe-shaped piece of copper here, and he started heating up one end of the iron. Now, when you heat up the iron, what does it do to the particles in the iron bar? they make them move faster. Okay? So as they move faster, okay, the particles that make up the iron run into each other okay, and they run into the copper. Now, copper conducts electricity very well. Iron, not as well. So the electrons on the particles of the copper started moving because they got hot. Okay? And as a result, they flowed through this wire as opposed, or through this bar as opposed to the iron bar. And as a result, they generated a magnetic field and the compass needle went and turned parallel to the copper bar, proving that he could turn heat into electricity. All right, everybody follow there? We don't use that very much, not at least to generate electricity, because like I said, it's not very efficient. It's more efficient to burn fuel, to make steam, to turn a turbine to generate electricity than it is to directly turn heat into electricity. All right. Um, what we typically use this for is in things like circuit breakers, okay, or in uh, thermostat switches and things like that, that um, need to turn on a circuit when heat gets too much. All right? So typically these are used in those kind of switches. So in your house, if you get too much electricity flowing through a circuit, the breaker trips and prevents any more electricity from going through there so the circuit doesn't get hot and start a fire. Well, that's essentially a thermocouple. It generates enough electricity to trip the switch. All right? um, same thing if you're driving your car to make the fan come on in your car to cool it off is, is essentially a thermocouple, a thermostat switch. Okay? It gets hot enough that there's enough electricity to flip the switch and turn on the fan. Everybody follow? All right? So it's useful in that way, but it's not useful for generating electricity. Okay, so that was, uh, that was Seebeck. Sorry, we better circle him. He was important. Okay, so Seebeck did that, okay, um, turned electricity into, um, or turned heat into electricity. All right, nuclear and solar energy. These are the sort of latest ones to be discovered and, and harnessed and understood. For the longest time, people looked up in the sky, they saw the sun, and they went, oh, that's bright. And then they wondered, what is it? And they said, well, it looks like it's on fire. So it's just a big fire. It's a big fire out in space. What's the problem with the idea of the sun being a big fire? Uh, not so much that it's not controlled, because the sun really is a big fire. You need oxygen for fire, for chemical fire. What kind of fire is the sun? Nuclear fire. All right. 
there is no oxygen required for the process that fuels the sun. Okay, and so that was the problem. People were like, well, but if the sun's out in space and there's no air in space, how does the sun burn fuel? The answer is it doesn't burn fuel. All right, it uses a process known as nuclear fusion. Okay, if the sun was a chemical fire, it would have burned out five uh, after five thousand years. Right, it would have exhausted its entire mass, which is. Uh, Which is that much? It's huge. Okay, to give you an idea, the Earth is uh, no ten to the twenty-four. Sorry, kilograms. Considerably smaller, on the order of nearly a million times. Okay, the Sun is nearly a million times more massive than the Earth is. Okay, so if it was a chemical fire, it would have exhausted this mass. In 5,000 years, how old is the sun? Billions of years old. Okay, somewhere in the neighborhood of like six or seven billion years old. All right, and it's still got a long time to go yet. Okay, because it doesn't use chemical fire; it uses nuclear fusion. What happens in nuclear fusion, guys, is this: in the sun, anyway. Okay, is the sun is made almost entirely of hydrogen. Right now, hydrogen is the simplest molecule. But the sun is so massive that its gravity can push the atoms of hydrogen together and turn them into helium atoms. Its gravitational pull is that strong, all right, that these atoms are just squished together so hard that they actually become other atoms, all right, simply by that the sun's sheer weight, all right. So you got these H atoms that are you know flying around at incredibly high speeds because the sun is you know millions of degrees and the gravity pulls them together and forces them to become this all right it takes those two protons and squeezes them together and forms a helium molecule when that happens huge amounts of energy are released all right like we're talking um, you know millions of nuclear bombs detonated all at the same time Okay, huge, huge amounts of energy okay, on the sun as a result of pushing two atoms together. Okay, now, I mean, there's an unimaginable number of these reactions happening every second on the surface of the sun. All right, if you were to get, you know, if I was to fuse two hydrogen atoms right in front of us right now, we wouldn't even know it. All right, because two atoms by themselves is nothing. All right, but if you think about how many of those are happening on the sun every second, it's a lot. Okay, because the sun is very, very massive. Okay, everyone follow me there. All right, so that's the sun's type of nuclear energy. The type of energy, nuclear energy we use on Earth is the opposite. Instead of putting atoms together, we do what? We split them. Yeah. Okay. Nuclear fission is what we use. Fission is the splitting. All right. And I showed you that the very first day of class. I showed you that you shoot these smaller particles, usually neutrons, at big atoms like plutonium and uranium. And when they hit them, they make them break apart. And when they break apart, all the energy that was holding them together is released. All right. Fission's not nearly as energetic as fusion. All right. But it's pretty energetic, as we've obviously seen. All right. Nuclear power plants generate huge amounts of electricity. Nuclear weapons cause mass destruction. All right, so uh, there's a lot of energy stored within the nucleus of the atom. There's a lot of energy needed to hold matter together. And when you bypass that and you make energy or matter destroy itself or fuse it together and change it, you release all of that energy. All right, so solar energy results from okay, the hydrogen hydrogen nuclear fusion reaction. Okay. So how did we discover nuclear energy? Obviously, we couldn't go to the sun and watch it happen. Anybody know? Um, well, eventually we did, okay? But people, unfortunately, accidentally discovered that a lot of materials on Earth gave off energy naturally, and it wasn't an energy that was very good for you. All right, um, Mary Curie is one of those people. Right, she studied the uh, radioactive effects of certain radioactive materials, and she died very young because she got what? Yeah, radiation poisoning and cancer. All right, because she worked with all this stuff, and of course at the time it's like, well, it's just a metal. Metals are harmless, but this was a radioactive metal. All right, not like you know hot radioactive, but it was radioactive enough that you know, she's handling it all the time, whatever, doing experiments with it, and always exposed. It was like she was standing in an x-ray machine all the time. 
right? I mean, she probably left a shadow on the wall that's still there, okay, as a result of all this radiation that, that she was working with, right? And other people were in kind of the same situation, okay? Um, um, Henri Becquerel was another guy, okay? Um, I actually saw a thing on the Discovery Channel about his office. He worked, guys, in 1896, okay? His office is still at the university there. Nobody uses it. They went into the into his office with a Geiger counter. Right? It's one of those things that clicks when it gets near radiation. Okay? And they went over to his desk, and before they were within 10 feet of it, the Geiger counter was off the scale. His desk is still hot, radioactively hot, because he had all this stuff in it. Okay? All the ra all the pieces of like uranium and stuff like that, and radium and stuff like that that he was working with, he kept in his desk. So imagine him sitting at his desk with all this radioactive stuff in the drawers, right, that he's working with. I mean, you, you don't have a very long life expectancy. Again, it would have been for him like sitting in an x-ray machine, you know, 12, 16 hours a day, right? Um, so people discovered that there were radioactive effects. The way they discovered that was almost completely by accident. Um, they were taking pictures of these radioactive metals. They didn't know they were radioactive at the time, okay? And they had the film sitting on the table beside the stuff. And they put the film in the camera, took the pictures, and when they went to develop the pictures, the film was all ruined. Why was the film all ruined? The radiation from the radioactive materials exposed all the film, right? Normally, film is contained in a plastic box, right, or a plastic container, and visible light can't penetrate that, so the film's protected. But radiation can go right through plastic, no problem, and it exposed all the film. So, like, well, what was, what's going on here? There's got to be some form of energy that's exposing this film, okay? And that's how they discovered that this stuff gave off this, this energy. Of course, they didn't realize it was harmful, and a lot of them had very short careers, right, as a result. All right, so nuclear energy is potential energy stored in the nucleus of an atom, okay? If it's split, it's fusion, or it's fission, sorry. If they combine, it's fusion. All right, then to the simplest stuff, motion and energy. Anytime something is moving, it has kinetic energy. It has mechanical energy, right? Because if it's moving, it can do work, right? If it runs into something, it will transfer energy to it. Okay? And that was the idea behind this thing. Okay? How many people have seen one of these before? All right? This is Newton's cradle. He got in really big trouble when he made this. Like, he nearly got his head cut off. All right? Um, reason being is uh, people at that time were a little more afraid of things, let's say, all right? Uh, maybe a little bit more closed-minded about things. Um, and when he pulled that one ball away and let it go, and it hit the others, and the ball on the other side flew up, people went, you're a witch. That's magic. How did you do that? All right? I mean, Newton knew. He said, well, you know, I did work. I pulled this ball up. Hey, that took that took energy from me. I, I pulled it up and I let it go, and then when it hit here, the energy went through the other balls, and the other one flew up on the other side. They're like, no, it didn't. You're you're a witch. Okay, he got in really big trouble. All right, nearly got himself killed over this thing. Okay, the thing that you use to entertain little kids now. Tick 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 tick. Right, and it's like, man, but it got him in really big trouble. All right, uh, so he had to really come up with a way to explain this. All right, he, um, so he tried to explain, you know, with this idea of a, of a force that moved through things and whatever else, but it, it got him out of trouble enough to save his life, but it wasn't really an accurate explanation of what was going on. Okay, um, so this guy named uh, Gottfried Leibniz, okay, reasoned that whatever causes this ball to move is some sort of force, okay, and he called it vis viva, or this living force, because that was something that didn't get him in trouble, all right, that living things could generate this force and that that was okay and that didn't make you a witch, all right. Um, and so anyway, uh, for simplicity's sake, that term was later t uh, turn uh, turned into energy. People still weren't explaining it very well, though, because they were saying it was still something material. Right? And that the energy was this invisible stuff that could move through things. Okay? But stuff has to be made of something, which means it has to have mass. Does energy have any mass? No. Okay? Energy doesn't have mass. Matter has mass, but energy doesn't. All right? And so, as a result, this was still really not an accurate explanation of how things were working. 
right? Um, anyway, from there, they came up and they decided and discovered that there were different kinds of this force or this flow, right? There was the kind of force that moving objects could exert, and there was the kind that was stored or hidden and it could later be released, all right, which was potential energy, and specifically in this case, gravitational potential energy. That's what this ball here has. Okay? This ball has gravitational potential energy because it's been lifted higher than the others. And as a result, what will gravity do to it? Pull it down. Okay? You have to do work to move it further away from the Earth. Gravity will take it right back. Right? So it's gravitational potential energy that gets turned into kinetic, which can do work on the other balls and make this one fly up on the other side. All right. So is it possible for something to have both kinds of energy at the same time? Sure it is. When I let this ball go and it comes down to here, it's still above the others and now it's moving. All right? So it's possible to have this mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and gravitational potential energy or elastic potential energy of the object. All right. Okay, heat and energy. Okay, heat again was the most common form of energy, and mostly because almost any system with moving parts generates it, right? As a result of friction. Okay, so people were trying to figure out how does this heat happen, all right? The Greeks knew. Okay, they, I mean they had an idea anyway, right? That heat uh, was actually something that fire gave off, all right? It was something that came from that, okay? and they knew that when you got close to it, you got warmer. It was transferring something to you. So they had the idea, right? They just didn't really know what it was. All right? So this guy here named Joseph Black came along, and he discovered that if you put a cup of hot water beside a cup of cold water, the cold water got hotter. Ooh. Rocket science. Okay? But it was an important discovery, because people were trying to figure out what's transferred, the hot or the cold? Okay, like a lot of people, you know, you say, oh, don't go outside because, you know, you'll get colder. You'll let all the cold air in when you open the door in the wintertime. You're not letting cold air in. You're letting the hot air out. Okay, you always transfer heat. You can't transfer coldness. Okay, coldness is a lack of energy. Heat is an excess of it. All right, so the, the molecules in the air inside your house are moving very, very, very fast. All right, when you open the door, they run into molecules that are not moving as fast, and as a result, they transfer energy to them. So those molecules outside get warmer, all right? And the ones inside lose energy to them. So you're not letting the cold air in, you're letting the hot energy out. Okay, everybody follow me on that? That's what his little uh, experiment with the two cups proved. Okay? He proved that energy flows only in one direction, from hot to cold, okay? And not vice versa. Okay. So, his discovery led to this idea, thermodynamics, the movement of energy. Dynamic means moving or changing, thermal meant heat, so the movement or changing of heat. Okay, now, he explained this incorrectly though, that was his problem. He said that heat was an invisible fluid that he called caloric and it could flow through things. Okay, what's the problem with that idea? If it's a fluid, it has to be made of what? matter and then it must have mass right and if it has mass then as it flows from one thing to another one thing should decrease in mass and the other should increase in mass and that's not what happens okay those two cups of water don't change mass they change energy but at least we were getting to the right idea there was a flow from hot to cold okay all right so uh, later on, this idea was, was uh, refined a little bit, and we said, this is because atoms are moving or vibrating, okay? And they move more quickly in something that's hot than they do in something that's cold, and that vibration can be transferred by contact, by convection, okay, or by radiation sometimes, all right? And that's what heat is. Okay. Later on, another important thing gets discovered. A guy named Benjamin Thompson, who for some reason changed his name to Count Rumford, okay, um, moved to Bavaria and became the Minister of War. The Minister of War's job is to supervise the construction of cannons. 
Okay. Cannons are essentially made by taking a big blob of metal and boring it out with a big drill. All right. So they've got this big blob of metal and they've got this big hand operated almost look like an auger like you would use to make a hole for ice fishing, okay? A really really big drill bit. And they would run this thing and people would have these handles and they would just turn this thing all day. All right? And grind a big hole into the cannon where the cannonball and the powder could be jammed in. Now, when you do that, when you drill something, does it get hot? Why? Right, there's friction. But friction only makes heat if there's what? Movement. Okay. What they discovered was this, this, that they could actually boil a kettle of water on top of the cannon while they were drilling it. Okay. So they're trying to figure out where is this energy to, to boil this water coming from. Right? Like this is the guy who like invented the coffee break. Right? Because th by the time they had bored out a whole bunch of stuff, the water was hot. They could have a break. And they could have a cup of tea, all right, as a result of all this work that they had done, all right? So essentially what he figured out is the energy that's boiling this water isn't coming from the cannon. Because when we start the day, that, bo that water's not boiling. There's no energy just inherent in the cannon. It has to be coming from somewhere. The only place that energy could come from was the people that were operating the drill, okay? They got tired. It was hard work, all right? All that energy was getting converted into heat. Okay, everyone follow? So he found that mechanical energy, this movement, could turn into heat. We could convert one type of energy into another. And discovering that was really important. Because once we discovered that energy forms were convertible, then we could make machines that could really go. Okay, we could say, all right, I can make this thing actually do this. All right, and that's what we do when we generate electricity. We take chemical potential energy and fuel, and we burn it to release heat. Okay? And that heat can make the molecules in water move so fast that they turn into steam. Those molecules can then flow through pipes under pressure and turn turbines, which can make electricity. All right? It's a lot of energy conversions to get what we want at the end result. All right? So it was a, a huge discovery about the, the mutability, that he called it, okay? the changeability of, of energy from one kind to another. All right. So his other thing here the current definition of energy. Energy is the capacity or ability to do work. All right, then Joule. Joule's the most important guy. How do we know that? Yeah, because the unit for energy is named after him. Okay, if you do something important, generally that's how science works, right? Okay, you discover something, you get to name it, and well, most scientists will name it after themselves because that makes sense, all right? Um, so, uh, a guy named Sadi Carno first comes along. He did a lot of experiments that try to turn heat into mechanical energy. There's a problem with that. You can do it, but heat is the lowest form of energy. All right. We know that because almost everything produces it as a byproduct. Okay? It's almost the waste energy of all other processes. That said, if you have enough of it, you can turn it into something useful. Okay? Um, what Joule did is he proved that you could convert kinetic and potential energy into heat. Okay? Like, uh, you know, Rumford, he, he found that it could happen, but Joule was able to prove it quantitatively. Okay, he devised these two very simple experiments, right? He took a block and he put it on wires and he pulled it away almost like Newton's cradle from this block, right? This is where he got, I mean, Newton's cradle is where he got the idea for this experiment. He said, the energy flows through these other things and lifts the block up on the other side. I'm going to show that this gravitational potential energy that this block has as a result of me lifting it can be turned into heat. So he let this block fall and slam into this stationary block. And when that happened, temperature in the block went up. All right? You can do this at home. Take a hammer, take a piece of wood, bang on the piece of wood in the same spot five, six times. Put your finger where you've been hitting the wood. Guarantee you, it will be hot. Okay? Because when you slam that hammer down, you've got potential energy when you've lifted it, you turn it into kinetic energy, and then the board stops it. Okay? And as a result of stopping it, it takes away all of that mechanical energy. Well, that energy has to go somewhere. 
right? The law of conservation of energy says you can't create matter, you can't destroy it, but you can turn it into other forms. So when you hit that board, you hear the sound of the, of the board, right? That's a type of energy. Sound is energy. But the rest of the energy gets turned into the deformation of the wood and the resulting heat. You push on those molecules, those particles in the wood, and you make them gain energy, and they get hot as a result, all right? Same thing here, all right? He proved that kinetic energy could turn into heat as well. He had these falling masses on pulleys and these fan blades with the holes in them, and it would spin inside this jar, all right? And the spinning inside that jar would cause actually the, jar, the air in the jar to warm up. Okay, very simple experiments, but they proved unequivocally mechanical energy and heat were very much related to each other and could be converted into each other. Okay, all right, questions on that? Okay. All right, on the next sheet there are some questions. I will show you which ones I want you to do here. Okay, um, two, three, And let's go twelve. Okay, these ones are pretty short because you're just describing an appliance. All right, so those are the ones I want you to do. I want you to do two, three, four, six, seven, nine, okay, ten, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. All right. Reason I'm having you do those guys is because um, we'll have a quiz probably on that stuff next week sometime. Okay, they're pretty easy. All of them are in here. Okay, all of them are in those notes. You just have to look through them. Okay, generally, guys, if you need to look something up to answer a question, should it be something you maybe highlight? Okay, in those notes, probably be a good idea. Okay.